Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Knockout Opioid Abuse Day Learning Series webinar, Emerging Threats Within the Opioid Crisis. Some housekeeping. Today's webinar is designated for one AMA PRA Category 1 credit, one ANCC contact hour, one ACPE contact hour, one AAPA Category 1 CME credit, and one ADA CERP continuing education credit by the American Academy of CME Inc. And for any pharmacist claiming credit, please note that your credit will be uploaded to CPE Monitor within 30 days. This webinar has also been approved by NJOEMS for one EMT elective CEU. And PA Planner, Dean Barone discloses that he serves on the Speakers Bureau of Ethicon and Johnson & Johnson and all other faculty and planning members have nothing to disclose. Today's webinar is jointly provided by the Partnership for a Drug for New Jersey and the American Academy of CME Inc. and is held in collaboration with NJ Cares and the New Jersey Office of the Attorney General and the Opioid Education Foundation of America. And I thank them for their partnership and support and collaboration on today's learning activity and throughout this year long learning series. And I thank all of you for continuing to join us. I also welcome our expert panelists for today who will speak and possibly show us some graphic images about some current trends and threats that we are facing. And I thank them for being with us today. I welcome Dr. Matthew Salzman, who's the uh, Associate Professor at uh, Cooper Medical School and the Medical Director of the Addiction Medicine Consult Liaison Service at Cooper University Healthcare. And Bruce Ruck, who is the Managing Director of New Jersey Poison Center. So I thank you both for being with us. Um, we look forward to um, hearing your presentations. And Dr. Salzman, I'm going to turn uh, it over to you now. Great. Thank you so much. Um, are you able to hear me okay? <clears throat> yes, we can hear you. Went very okay. well. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really great to be here with you all today, virtually. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share some information with you. Um, this is information about me and happy to take questions via email uh, after the presentation. I'll do the best I can to respond to you. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, some disclosures, um, as, as was mentioned, I don't have any uh, financial conflicts of interest. Just so you know, I'm a classically trained musician and as a result, not a great scientist. Um, I do have some grant funding that supports some of my time. And I put this here not because I think it represents a conflict of interest, but as an opportunity to uh, express gratitude to the grantors and also the principal investigators, um, Drs. Delgado and Dr. Uh, and D'Onofrio, who have invited me to participate in um, these important research projects. Um, the picture that you have here is from an episode of classic Star Trek, uh, the title of which was The Trouble with Tribbles. I am a fan of our uh, almost all things related to Star Trek. And um, I call this talk uh, The Trouble with Trank. And as you'll see, as we move through the presentation, that um, the prevalence of xylazine, or as it's referred to on the street as trank or trank dope, <clears throat> seems to be expanding the same way the Tribbles did on the Starship Enterprise. Um, just a couple of other things, as was mentioned, some of the pictures that I have for you are disturbing, and it is not my intention to upset anybody. And um, if you feel like you need to not look at the pictures, that's totally understandable, um, but it's really to uh, present the scope of the problem that our patients are struggling with right now, and also um, the healthcare systems who are still trying to figure out how best to take care of um, these patients. I'll also mention that I am a harm reductionist. Um, and I think that um, the best thing that we can do for our patients is expand access to harm reduction um, and that um, Adulterants in the street supply are not new, right? They go back for a very long time. Going back to the early 2000s, we were dealing, fentanyl was still an adulterant in the street supply. And now fentanyl has really uh, supplanted uh, heroin. Um, and we've been dealing with things like clenbuterol in the opioid supply and levamisole in the cocaine supply, all of which have led to devastating health outcomes for our patients who use drugs. Um, and that this is an opportunity to advance the conversation past decriminalization and into legalization uh, of drugs so that we can really regulate the supply uh, and that way patients know what they're getting uh, when they choose to use drugs. Um, 
I'm going to, uh, so just so you know, the next slide is a case presentation, and it starts off with what some may find to be a disturbing image of a patient that I helped take care of here uh, in Camden, New Jersey, and you can go ahead to that next slide. <clears throat> So this is a young man who presented twice to our emergency department. He was first brought in by his parents uh, in, in a private vehicle. Um, he was engaged by one of my colleagues in the parking lot and uh, declined to come into the emergency department to get care um, because he said he just wasn't ready. And so his parents wound up bringing him back home. Um, Ultimately, I believe they called EMS and he was brought in by ambulance and uh, was amenable to staying in the hospital. Um, when he got into the emergency department, his blood pressure was a little bit low. Uh, his heart rate was a little bit fast. And, you know, in uh, trying to examine him completely, uh, you know, this is what we found. And you can see his um, humerus is exposed on the right arm. And the image on the other side of the screen is his um, left lower extremity, and you can see at the top of the wound, these are actually maggots that are, have infested uh, the wound. This is a young man who was uh, injecting um, multiple bags and bundles of fentanyl adulterated with xylazine every day, um, and ultimately got to the point where he just couldn't really um, be at home anymore. He had been experiencing homelessness. Uh, residing on the streets up in the Kensington and Allegheny section of Philadelphia, ultimately decided to seek care in our emergency department. You can go ahead to the next slide. You can see some lab work here. His uh, sodium was quite low. His potassium was a little bit elevated. Um, his um, white count was a little bit elevated. He was profoundly anemic with a hemoglobin of 2.5. <clears throat> his uh, acute phase reactants were very high, which is not surprising. He had a urine drug screen sent that was positive for methadone and fentanyl, and we checked urine xylazine level, and that came back at uh, 9750 nanograms per milliliter. He had bacteria in his blood. Um, he was actually taken for an amputation of his lower extremity and of his upper extremity, and what had what we learned over the course of time was that um, he ha he had actually auto amputated his right upper extremity where his forearm had just fallen off at one point and he was left with that humerus exposed for quite some time. Um, he spent a fair amount of time in the hospital uh, receiving antibiotics and pain medication, um, multiple surgeries. <clears throat> and ultimately was discharged to a skilled nursing facility for ongoing IV antibiotics and physical therapy. He initially declined medications for opioid use disorder. We offered him buprenorphine and methadone um, that he said he felt like he just really didn't need. Um, and so uh, he transitioned out to a skilled nursing facility, ultimately to be discharged home with follow-up in our clinic. Um, he came into our clinic disclosing that he had, had, he had a return to use uh, and had an opioid overdose and uh, and then was amenable to starting buprenorphine. And I believe we continue to follow him in clinic uh, to this day. You can go ahead to the next slide. <clears throat> um, not that long ago, the Biden-Harris administration declared fentanyl uh, combined with xylazine as an emerging threat to the United States, although I will point out that xylazine is not new to the street supply and earliest reports of xylazine go back to the early 2000s with reports out of Puerto Rico. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide. And Dr. Jean Marie Perone, who's a physician at the hospital at the University of Pennsylvania, published what I think is a very important and powerful uh, article in the Philadelphia Inquirer saying that we're talking about fentanyl and xylazine all wrong and that we really shouldn't be stigmatizing people living with addiction, but we encourage them uh, and support them in their journey to recovery. And, um, you know, the current uh, move to defund programs like the Savage Sisters and Prevention Point in Philadelphia, I think are really going to lead, of, lead to a lot of dis disastrous health outcomes, including increased rates of HIV and hepatitis C and drug-related overdose deaths. Um, and I would encourage you all to read this article when you have the chance. Go ahead to the next slide. But getting into the uh, thick of it, um, what we've seen over time is that xylazine prevalence has increased over time. Um, where it was initially uh, in a few states, and you can see uh, category A in the upper upper left-hand side of your screen, and you can see how it's progressed over time, kind of wrapping around uh, the south and moving west across the United States. 
you can go ahead to the next slide. And then you can see um, by percentages, this is some older data waiting for some newer data to come out. And I, if I've missed it, I apologize. But you can see in the South, 193% increase uh, in xylazine um, over just a year. Um, and you can see how this uh, continues uh, to spread throughout the United States. You can go ahead to the next slide. <clears throat> what we're seeing in New Jersey, uh, again, a little bit older data, waiting for some new data to come back, uh, is that this prevalence has just continued to increase. And you can see a dramatic increase from 2020 to 2021, uh, presence of xylazine in the street supply. I can tell you anecdotally that some of our patients report being able to purchase um, pure xylazine. And the way they feel like they know this is that they use fentanyl test strips on their drugs. Um, and their fentanyl test strips are negative for presence of fentanyl. Um, and they do believe they're getting uh, pure xylazine, although I haven't uh, confirmed this yet um, through any laboratory data. You can go ahead to the next slide. And then you can see how it breaks down uh, on a county level. Uh, in terms of uh, bags that are submitted that uh, are in which xylazine is detected. You can go ahead to the next slide. <clears throat> and then just a little bit more epidemiology that we get um, from uh, Philadelphia. And we know that in New Jersey, a fair percentage of our patients will actually travel to Kensington and Allegheny to purchase their drugs. And you can see that the percentage of xylazine that's in a bag of fentanyl adulterated with xylazine continues to go up over time. And the amount of fentanyl uh, that's there has remained about the same. And the recent estimates, and um, I don't have a, any way to fact check this, but based on some conversations, is that a bag of fentanyl has between two and 5,000 micrograms of fentanyl and upwards of 40 milligrams of xylazine in it. Um, and what I can tell you is that in our clinic, we do have reflex testing for xylazine, and about 95% of our patients who test positive for fentanyl are also testing positive for xylazine. You can go ahead to the next slide. Um, a little bit more data um, from Philadelphia, and uh, you can see again an increase from 2019 to 2021 with xylazine-related overdose deaths in Philadelphia, and you can go ahead to the next slide. Um, and this is a, a really interesting paper that looks to examine uh, individuals' experience with xylazine. And the par part that I'd highlight here is that um, about three quarters of individuals who receive xylazine in their drugs really don't want it. Um, this is not something that's sought out, uh, but has just been put into the street supply. And we'll talk about why that is in just a little bit. You can go ahead to the next slide. So what is xylazine? Uh, it is a large animal sedative. It is not approved for use in humans in the United States or anywhere else uh, that I'm aware of for that matter. It is a central alpha-2 receptor agonist with mixed mechanism of action, and it causes a whole lot of things that you can see listed here. Decreased norepinephrine release, decreased acetylcholine release. It really agonizes multiple receptors. Um, it will cause elevated blood pressure followed by decreased blood pressure and respiratory depression with a potentially lethal dose of between 40 and 2400 milligrams in humans. And you can go ahead to the next slide. <clears throat> it was initially created and um, tested in humans as an antihypertensive agent, but it was not approved for human use and the trials were stopped due to uh, low blood pressure and increased sedation. Um, it is often referred to on the street again as either Trank or Trank Dope. Uh, it is available uh, for as a large animal sedative, and you can see that here, uh, and it comes in various solutions. It is unscheduled in the United States, but there is a move to make it Schedule 3. Um, and in animals, it's often used uh, in combination with ketamine or barbiturates. You can go ahead to the next slide. What are the common effects that we see in humans, uh, mostly report drowsiness and lethargy with prolonged sedation, um, a lot of bradycardia, hypotension. Uh, again, initially when we see patients uh, immediately after use, they may be hypertensive and they will appear intoxicated often with slurred speech. And you can go ahead to the next slide. <clears throat> 
Another interesting paper that came out not too long ago looked at um, multiple centers that were receiving patients who were using opioids, some of which were using opioids adulterated with xylazine. And basically what they found was that uh, individuals who uh, had xylazine in them were actually less likely to suffer a cardiac arrest uh, after presentation to the emergency department. And the kind of the hypothesis around that is that um, because of rapid onset of action and potency that individuals are actually using less uh, drugs when they have xylazine in the drugs than uh, individuals who are using uh, fentanyl alone. Uh, it's really hard to kind of suss that out. Um, and again, just to reiterate, we do know that overdose-related deaths are going up uh, with xylazine presence. So um, I, I point this paper out. I think it's a really um, thoughtful paper. I'd encourage you all to read it and review it, um, but hard to make some clear uh, conclusions. You can go ahead to the next slide. Uh, and again, um, xylazine is spreading across the United States. The reason that we think xylazine is added to, um, to the fentanyl is that uh, fentanyl has rapid onset of action, but has a short duration of action. So um, xylazine tends to give uh, fentanyl longer legs, is how it's referred to on the street. Um, it's got a sedative effect, maybe kind of potentiating the effects of fentanyl and making the clinical effect a little bit more similar to heroin, uh, and again, uh, lots of risk of intense sedation. You can go ahead to the next slide. One of the questions that come up is regarding xylazine withdrawal, and there's a lot of question as to whether or not xylazine withdrawal is really a thing, and you can go ahead to the next slide. <clears throat> Um, this is a picture uh, from another patient that I helped take care of uh, in the hospital, and we wrote this up as a case report, and you can see it as the reference, uh, the second reference on this slide. Um, you know, patients do report that xylazine withdrawal feels different than opioid withdrawal, and I think that it's important that we listen to our patients and making, um, uh, making premature conclusions that... Uh, xylazine withdrawal is not necessarily a real thing, but may just be a manifestation of severe opioid withdrawal or benzodiazepine withdrawal um, uh, is really kind of dismissive of our patients. And we really just need to be patient forward and believe them when they tell us this. Um, and, and, and I say that, and I'll also just point out that it was the individuals who were using drugs that were alerting us initially that there was something new in the supply uh, and we kind of didn't really believe them and they were 100% right. Um, and so um, we think that xylazine withdrawal is probably analogous to clonidine withdrawal. <clears throat> and you can go ahead to the next slide. And uh, clonidine is a, a medication that's used uh, for uh, as an antihypertensive and with a whole other uh, bunch of indications. And if you look back in the 1970s, uh, there were papers published looking at the likelihood and um, effects of clonidine withdrawal. And what we learned is that abrupt cessation of clonidine does result in uh, rebound hypertension. And at least in this one paper, what they found was that you would get increased urinary levels of um, uh, of catecholamines like epinephrine and norepinephrine, showing that you would get a surge of these excitatory catecholamines that were, were largely contributing to increased blood pressure and heart rate, and, um, and also associated with adverse events like heart attack and stroke. Um, and so if we know that xylazine and clonidine kind of look similar and have similar effects, I think uh, we need to err on the side of caution and believe that xylazine withdrawal is we real and treat patients so as to avoid these um, potential adverse cardiovascular effects. You can go ahead to the next slide. <clears throat> So for our, what I'm calling our index case at Cooper, this is a 29-year-old female who had come into Cooper. She initially presented to our clinic and was referred over to the hospital. And um, you can see what she was using here and how she kind of described um, her differences in withdrawal from Trank versus uh, dope alone. And these are her words. Um, uh, and so I... Uh, you know, I support her using her words and her lived experience. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide. And then you can see the medic. We wound up admitting her to the ICU because we really were concerned about adverse cardiac and cardiovascular events. Um, and you can see we put her on a hydromorphone PCA. We loaded her with phenobarbital. Uh, 
and we put her on a dexmedetomidine uh, infusion and also gave her tizanidine. These are all uh, central alpha-2 agonists. We did a buprenorphine microinduction, and she would get gabapentin and also ketamine for her dressing changes. You can go ahead to the next slide. And you can see that this continued on throughout her hospitalization, and she had a prolonged ICU course. You can go ahead to the next slide. And ultimately, we got her up to a pretty good dose of uh, buprenorphine. We were able to taper off a whole bunch of medications. You can go ahead to the next slide. And ultimately, she was uh, discharged to home. Um, she did have a return to use, came back to the hospital. We kind of did this all over again. We stabilized her on methadone. And the last time I saw her was about a year after her, admis her admission. And she had retained in sobriety uh, for a year and was doing pretty well. Um, in terms of trying to address the question as to whether or not xylazine withdrawal is a real new phenomenon, um, you can see some results from, uh, an, uh, I believe, still unpublished study from some colleagues over at the University of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, um, where it's just still really not clear. Um, but again, I think we need to believe patients that, uh, about their lived experience and kind of treat them as though this is a real withdrawal syndrome. You can go ahead to the next slide. Uh, and just some anecdotal reporting on what patients describe when they feel uh, what they perceive to be xylazine withdrawal. You can go ahead to the next slide. Um, and again, just some anecdotal reporting, uh, you know, 53% of patients believe that their withdrawal syndrome from xylazine is different than opioid withdrawal or other withdrawal states. Next slide. And we're treating this with clonidine uh, and other central alpha-2 agonists and also short courses of uh, benzodiazepines. Um, but we're still trying to figure out what best practices are for treating xylazine withdrawal. Uh, next slide. Uh, again, you're going to see some disturbing photos here, uh, and I apologize again, this is not to shock you, but just to show you what our patients are um, are kind of struggling with. Next slide. So this is a, a person, these are all individuals that I took care of at the hospital. Next slide. Um, this is bilateral upper extremity wounds, and you can see some scabbing, and, and you can see tendon exposure. Uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, next slide. Um, this is uh, an individual who identifies as a black male, and you can see different stages of wounds on uh, both arms. Next slide. Uh, and this is a young uh, individual who you can see has bone exposed, chronic osteomyelitis, who is ultimately likely going to need an amputation. Go ahead, next slide. Uh, and um, this is uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, another individual that we took care of here, Cooper, and then on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, an individual who presented to an emergency department in Delaware who uh, actually wound up undergoing bilateral upper extremity amputations. Next slide. Um, these are uh, wound care recommendations that were published in an article that you can find online. This is based on robust clinical experience from folks uh, up at Prevention Point who are taking care of individuals uh, on, and through a street medicine initiative um, in Philadelphia. Next slide. And what we really try to advocate for is minimal surgical intervention. Um, Unlike other wounds, uh, we think that surgical debridement down to healthy tissue is just going to make things worse. Uh, and then, um, unfortunately, what we're learning from our surgical colleagues is that even delayed skin grafting and wound flaps and other surgical attempts at uh, revision and repair um, just aren't terribly successful. And a lot of patients, unfortunately, are ending up with amputations. Next slide. So why does this happen? Um, there are a lot of different reasons that we think this happens. One thing is skin picking behavior, increased injection into wounds, co-occurring infections, prolonged downtime leading to compression and pressure, uh, poor wound healing environment, poor nutritional status. There is animal evidence to show that direct injection of xylazine into tissue does cause cell damage and cell death. There is some thought that maybe there's an obliter obliterative vasculitis from repeated injections, but this actually hasn't been uh, demonstrated thus far. And dermatologic uh, specimens don't actually show any vasculitic uh, effects. So it's multifactorial. Next slide. Um, some more recommendations on wound care supplies and how to take care of these wounds, and these are uh, available online. 
Next slide. And some other information from the National Harm Reduction Coalition. Um, and I think that's my time. Uh, and I think that's the end of my slide. So thank you again for having me today. And I'll stay tuned for um, Q&A after. Thanks, Doctor. I think that um, information, while very disturbing to your uh, point, and some of those images, um, it's so important that we see and we learn from this. So um, thank you for that. I know we have some questions in the chat, and we'll get to them um, after our next um, presentation um, by uh, Bruce Ruck from New Jersey um, Poison Control. And um, Bruce is going to be talking about some other trends. Um, equally equally as disturbing. So Bruce, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, as I start this presentation, I just want to thank the fellows and the other toxicologists here at the New Jersey Poison Center. Uh, the A lot of the epidemiology and stuff has been put together with all their assistance and a lot of their assistance. And it's really the team here and this whole presentation is really a team effect from the New Jersey Poison Center. Can I have the next slide, please? Just a little bit about the Poison Center, for those of you who are not familiar with us, we are the state's regionally certified center, and we do get around 50,000 calls a year for assistance. I use the word calls, but they could be texts, they could be chats as well, and our uh, 800 number is the national 800 number that we use. The uh, Poison Center, we also run the state AIDS STD hotline, which we have since the 1980s, and since January of 2020, the state COVID hotline as well. Can I have the next slide, please? The staff of the Poison Center are physicians, nurses, pharmacists. We're 24-7, we're 365, and everybody here is trained specifically to handle uh, the toxicology and the overdose and drug information questions that we do receive. Next slide, please. So the two cases that really got us started, first one here is a 47-year-old that was found unresponsive with a bottle of Alprazolam and Neptune's Fix. And that was very shortly followed by another case of a 26-year-old that was brought into the emergency department by a relative who found him uh, with altered mentation, not responding after the ingestion of Neptune's Fix. And he had used the Neptune, uh, Neptune's Fix for abuse purposes. The relative also uh, thought that uh, the product contained Kratom, but Kratom was not listed on the product label. Next slide, please. Interestingly enough, this uh, second for uh, the 47-year-old man in this case is actually the same as the first case. He presented twice, and he came in by EMS after being found lethargic at home. He received naloxone uh, at home and woke up. The family said he took Neptune's Fix Elixir. And again, this is the same case or the same gentleman that was seen uh, previously. Then the next one here, the 69-year-old that was brought into the emergency department, family found him with an altered mental status. They found him with an empty bottle of Neptune's Fix, uh, T and M teen, on his nightstand. And the nurse mentioned that uh, the patient was in the ICU also uh, previously for uh, the same presentation, where a code stroke was called and uh, that was ruled out. And then the patient signed out of the facility against medical advice. Can I have the next slide, please? So TNM teen is an atypical antidepressant that is structurally related to the tricyclic antidepressants. And it does affect serotonin. And it also affects the, uh, it's an agonist at the mu opioid receptor. There are reports of overdoses leading to naloxone-responsive uh, respiratory depression, and there are reports of opiate-like withdrawal upon cessation of chronic use as well. Interestingly enough, this product is approved in Europe, Asia, and Latin America for the treatment of depression. It is not approved in the United States uh, at this time. Can I have the next slide, please? In August of uh, this past summer, August 21st, we alerted the New Jersey Department of Health and the Department of Consumer Affairs about a cluster of uh, TNEPTINE exposures, all from the same uh, type of product, the Neptune's Fix. And from July, I'm sorry, from June 17th to August 17th, we had received nine exposure calls from healthcare facilities. And that's really, really important to point out. If healthcare facilities do not report to us and 
ask for our assistance, let us know what's going on, we wouldn't have been able to put some of this epidemiolo uh, epidemiology together and pick up this outbreak. If one hospital would have gotten it and a second hospital would have gotten a case and a third, but if nobody called for assistance or let us know about it, this this cluster would have would not have been picked up. As of February 19th, uh, we had 38 cases with 35 unique patients. And as of yesterday, we had over 42 cases with 35 unique patients. So the numbers are still climbing. Uh, at this point, uh, we had provided information from our cases, from the literature, uh, and from the FDA. There was a warning initially issued in 2022 by the FDA, and we let the Department of Health and the Division of Consumer Affairs know about it. We also increased our vigilance trying to get information about where it was purchased, uh, who was using it exactly, et cetera. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? The Department of Health was fantastic. They went out and they uh, got an alert together very quickly, and that was distributed in August 25th. And that alert went out to healthcare professionals across the state of New Jersey. Can I have the next slide, please? This is uh, some bottles of the product that we were sent and or purchased. And what's really fascinating, and it didn't even dawn on me until the other day, that these bottles have different colors. The labels are different. The lid colors are different. And the back of one of the bottles here actually says for research purposes only. And they're selling it, they claim for research purposes, but you know, people go on the internet, everybody knows why it's being sold uh, in many of these places. And that's why it also goes by the name of gas station heroin, because that's one of the major places that it was being sold at, or still is sold at. Can I have the next slide, please? The use and abuse of TNFTN has been around for many years. Again, this cluster that we saw ignited our interest here at the Poison Center and again alerted us to make sure that the Department of Health and the Division of Consumer Affairs knew what was transpiring. Back in 2018, there was an MMWR report of 218 calls to poison centers, and that was from the years of 2000 to 2017, with the majority of cases actually being reported uh, in a two-year span between 2015 and 2017. Reports uh, in the MMWR included acute intoxication, withdrawal, uh, withdrawal and other co-ingestants that were being used. In 2001, there was another article published, and this was around 48 calls to poison centers, and that was in 2015 to 2020. But again, the majority of cases in a smaller time frame between 2019 and 2020. And February of this year and 2024, uh, the MMWR uh, published uh, our cases about severe illness due to Neptune's fixed uh, linked to and linked to synthetic cannabinoids. So uh, if I can have the next slide, please. This is really the uh, uh, emergency medicine toxicology fellow that we had did a great job. They were able to go out and get uh, some of the bottles sent to us that people actually used. They arranged for analytical testing of the TNF team from our samples. And you can see here, there was more than just TNFTN in most of them. In the first bottle had cavein. The second bottle had uh, synthetic cannabinoids, MDMP, MDMB, 4-in-Panaca, ADP, 4-in-Panaca, CBD, THC, and the TNFTN. And you can see none of these things except for the TNFTN was on the actual label. So what people are buying is not what they expect, or maybe they do expect it because they're knowing they may have other knowledge that is not on these bottles. Can I have the next slide, please? The Cavain is a uh, cavalactone, uh, and that is found in the roots of the cava plant. The other two products that you see are synthetic cannabinoids, and they've been identified by the DEA as substances to be concerned about. They both act as potent agonists at the uh, cannabinoid uh, 1 receptor. And these products have been found besides in the uh, 
uh, these products of the Neptune's fix. They've also found these in heroin samples and fentanyl samples. The DEA actually placed these two products, the uh, both of these Pinaka products, uh, the FDA, I'm sorry, the DEA placed it in a Schedule 1 status as of December 12th, and it will remain in the status one uh, in for up to two years until such time uh, as the DEA either removes it, it falls off, or they go ahead and try to get it permanently scheduled, which will probably happen, and have them both scheduled as a uh, class one agent. Can I have the next slide, please? Blood samples, uh, analytic testing that was also performed showed uh, the T and F teen in the two patients and uh, showed one patient had uh, the MBMB14 Pinaka. So it is actually showing up in the patients, not just in the samples of uh, the purchased product. Can I have the next slide, please? And the interesting thing, I make a comparison here in the 2023-2024 uh, Neptune's fixed bottle for research purposes only, and the 2017 to 2018 K2 uh, outbreak is when we had the outbreak of K2 and spice uh, that were, for lack of better words, contaminated or contained synthetic cannabinoids. Both of these have warnings, right? That for research purposes only now, and back then, not for human use, only for fragrance purposes, not for consumption. And this game of whack-a-mole will continue. Uh, new, new chemicals added to different solutions. Names of them changed. Uses changed. Interesting, again, these warnings, not for human use or for research purposes only. And through hopefully through people reporting more cases to us of unusual side effects to medications, uh, use and abuse of things on the street, we'll be able to put together epidemiology and pick up future outbreaks of other substances. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, withdrawal has also been reported in uh, two of our cases, a 27-year-old male that presented to the ED requesting assistance in stopping uh, the TNF teen and entering rehab. And the second one was a 32-year-old male that developed withdrawal symptoms after stopping it. His symptoms began about 12 hours after the last dose, and he presented to the ED with body aches, pyloerection, vomiting, diarrhea, and dilated pupils. He reported taking 90 tablets a day of the Neptune's fix, which is interesting because a lot of the things that we had been purchasing has been a liquid, not necessarily uh, the tablet formation of it, formulation of it. Can I have the next slide, please? The demographics that we've been able to put together, median age of 38 with a range of 19 to 69, that is really similar to what we saw back in uh, the K2 spice outbreak, the synthetic outbreak of a few years ago. Not the typical 16, 17, 18 year old experimenting, but generally an older group of uh, people. Men more than women, 74% versus 26%. Can I have the next slide, please? The clinical characteristics altered mental status in 100% of the patients that we have been uh, involved with. You'll see respiratory depression in around 38%, seizures in roughly 42%, tachycardia in roughly 56%. So we do see a whole range of uh, symptomatology, acute kidney injury in around 17.7%, hypokalemia, as well as acidosis. Can I have the next slide, please? The therapies and uh, where these patients ended up, uh, around 53% needed benzodiazepines, 41% ended up with mechanical ventilation, 32% received naloxone. 23% were discharged right from the emergency room. Uh, the majority of them, 64%, were admitted to critical care units within the hospital that had uh, called us. Can I have the next slide, please? Where they were purchased, uh, 15 of them were from gas stations. And again, that's where the name gas station heroin comes from. We didn't coin it. That was coined elsewhere. You'll see uh, three of them were in convenience stores, vape and smoke shops. And it's interesting, some of the convenience stores that they're giving us names of, I'm kind of surprised to see, because these are not small little um, 
one on you know one off uh, small stores. They're major chain, and I think people sometimes use the name of the major chain just as a generic term. So gas stations, convenience stores, and vape shops. Quite a few. We don't know where they purchase it. The patient uh, was not willing to tell anybody where they actually bought it from. Can I have the uh, next slide, please? The location also is very similar to what we saw when we did have the K2 and spice outbreak, the synthetic cannabinoids, Mammoth County, Middlesex County, Ocean County, more the southern part of the state. Uh, other parts, obviously, you can we're seeing it, but the biggest was in the Mammoth, Middlesex, and Ocean area. Can I have the next slide, please? Nine states have actually banned it or restricted it at this point from Florida to Tennessee. I think we'll see those numbers increase dramatically in the next few months. Can I have the next slide? The In uh, January, Neptune Resources, the manufacturer or the distributor, agreed to call the Neptune's fixed product nationwide due to serious health effects. But then what was, became very interesting in February, 15th, another company called Super Chill Products agreed to recall their Neptune's fix. So it appears that there may be more than one person, not more than one company, not just distributing it, but potentially more than one company manufacturing the same product called Neptune's fix. Maybe that's why we see different colors of the bottles. Maybe that's why that one bottle has a red lid on it. It's very difficult to say, but now we have two different companies that are recalling products that they claim they make. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, there's been bip uh, bipartisan legislation, naturally, to crack down on this gas station heroin. And this, this article was published a few months ago. And can I have the next slide? And in New Jersey, actually, there is a bill that's pending to... Uh, Establish TNF teen as a class two or schedule two controlled dangerous substance. I'm not sure why schedule two. I think it would be a schedule one, like the federal government wants to do. Uh, and schedule two is really things that are allowed to be prescribed, just with much more control. Schedule one, the generally illegal substances. My gut is that's where it will end up as a schedule one type drug. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, at this point, I'm going to stop here. Again, I want to thank my colleagues very much from the New Jersey Poison Center for really doing a great job uh, in helping gather all the data. And to all the healthcare professionals out there, I really want to thank you for reporting these cases to us, asking for our assistance. And I ask you to continue. If you have cases unrelated to this, but related to something else, if you're not sure, if you call us on the 800 number, we're always glad to help you out. And we'll continue to work with the Health Department, Partners for Drug-Free New Jersey, Division of Consumer Affairs, and making sure that we get the word out when we see or hear about these outbreaks and clusters. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Bruce. That's um really frightening um, information, but um, so important that we know. And I know you shared um, how accessible these are in the presentation and also offline. So, um, you know, definitely something that we all need to be um, aware of. I know we have a number of um, questions in the, um, in the chat. And so we'll go right um, over to those. Um, Matt, you spoke about um, patients not being believed about um, their withdrawal symptoms. Um, can you speak to that and why that is and what um, our practitioners who are on can uh, can learn from that? Yeah, I, I, I think that it is, there's just some skepticism um, that I've heard from various providers that it, it's just not clear that xylazine withdrawal is a new and distinct entity or clinical syndrome, um, and that it may just represent severe opioid uh, withdrawal uh, or benzodiazepine withdrawal or a, you know stimulant use, stimulant washout, um, and 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 the truth is we really don't know. And the data that came out of Penn suggests that some individuals definitely report a different phenomenon with xylazine withdrawal, but it can just be 
difficult to suss out clinically. Um, but again, I think in terms of just being advocates for our patients and also being aware of the potential cardiovascular or hypertensive effects of xylazine withdrawal, we need to assume that it is a new and distinct phenomenon and we need to treat it appropriately um, just to do the best we can to take care of our patients. All right, thanks. And I know the um, the poll has um, launched and we appreciate um, all of our uh, attendees to give us some feedback on uh, today's webinar. So um, if you could take that poll, we appreciate it. Um, Bruce, I'm gonna go to you next with a question. Um, as a community advocate, um, what can we do to help get gas station heroin um, off the shelves or get the word out in the community? What are the most significant messages that we can share about the dangers of these non-scheduled well, drugs? That's a great question. So right now, the Neptune's fix has been recalled by the manufacturer. I think if somebody sees it, they should alert the store that's selling it. It's been recalled, but they could also alert their local health department in the town where they live or the county where they live. Uh, I know the state has asked uh, the county and local health departments to go in and make sure they are removed from shelves and they're not being sold. So I think if everybody does keep their eyes and ears open, but again, it's even more important even just as important as that is that everybody has to keep their eyes open for new substances being abused, new products. Today it's called Neptune's Fix. Tomorrow it may be called something else and it may all contain the same stuff. So we have to keep our eyes and ears open. We have to be very vigilant about looking for things such as this. Thanks. And can you just um, expand a little bit? You mentioned um, vaping and seeing some of these um in liquid form and vaping. Can you speak a little bit more to that? So personally, I have not seen these available as a vape. The liquid is being taken orally. I'm not aware of it being vaped at this point. All right, thanks. And um, Dr. Salzman, um, you, I, this kind of is a follow-up, I guess, to the question you just answered, but what is the role um, that you think that that stigma plays. I mean, you mentioned that you um, work in harm reduction and um, the resources that are available to that for that and the role stigma plays in um, some of these outcomes that you're seeing. Yeah, I, I mean, I think stigma continues to play a, a, a large role um, in um, in society and healthcare. Uh, and um, there are still those who will say that you know, substance use disorder in general is a behavioral problem and have not embraced the very well-described and broadly accepted neurobiologic model of addiction. Um, and, you know, we'd people will, you know, continue to promote the idea that, you know, our patients are just making bad choices, failing to understand that they're really not able to make other choices because of, you know, very clear neurobiologic changes in the brain that drive these behaviors. And so, and I get it, like it's, it's patients, um, you know, I, I, what's going on up in Kensington and Allegheny is really hard. It's hard for the community. It's hard for both communities, the community of people who use drugs and people who have been long-term residents of Kensington who want better things for their neighborhood. Um, but the, the idea of um, arresting people, not providing treatment and bulldozing, you know, 10 cities has never been shown to be helpful. It just displaces patients further and makes it harder for us to help take care of them. And so unfortunately stigma persists. And I just like to say that the words that we use matter um, and need to understand that these are our friends, our family, our citizens, and we just need to take good care of them. Absolutely. And, and similar to the question that I asked Bruce earlier um, that we got from the community advocates, what are some of the messages um, that uh, people can share if they are in the medical community or if they're in the prevention, uh, treatment, recovery community out there in the community? What what can they share? What resources are available? Where should they be directing people? Yeah, I think the harm reduction coalitions are doing great work and they have a lot of uh, on available uh, information that's free and online. Um, and some of the other things that I had in my slides from um, the Graken School up in Boston, I believe, and also out of um, uh, Center in Pittsburgh that talk about uh, wound care um, 
and then also creating, you know, working to create low barrier access to care, right? Um, and um, trying to get away from NIMBY mentality and, uh, you know, embracing communities and trying to create meaningful solutions that that are that are both community forward and patient forward, um, and just advocating for everybody and hearing what their needs are. Um, I hope that answered your question. It's complicated. I, so. I know it is. It is. And what um, is there a um, reversal drug? Uh, I think that was one of the one of the questions that we received. Um, similar to naloxone, is there something? There is not. Um, there are some things that have been discussed, but generally not found to be helpful. Uh, uh, and I don't even know if they've been tried because there's a concern that they could be harmful. Like, for example, uh, Yohimbi, you know, theoretically could be a reversal agent for xylazine, but, you know, is, you know, fraught with adverse events just with that alone. So kind of our current practice is to reverse an opioid overdose and support the patient through the xylazine uh, use as well. Uh, you know, with airway support, hemodynamic support, uh, through kind of standard measures. And then one more question for you. Um, why does it take so long for patients to get help um, when they are seeing and feeling these wounds happening to them? Um, are they very, they look painful. Are they very painful? What are you hearing? Yeah. So, uh, you know, differing reports about how much pain um, these wounds cause, they are, they do tend to be necrotic and I think they are generally very painful. One of the things that kind of confounds our understanding about pain around these wounds is that a lot of patients will continue to inject into the wounds themselves. Um, although I should mention that there are patients who report only using via insufflation nasally who still get these wounds. Um, wound care is just really hard to access. Um, you know, finding outpatient wound care centers that are even, that even know about these wounds, I think are few and far between. Uh, and even if they are aware of them, you know, they are also taking care of patients with diabetic wounds and sacral D cubes and things like that. And so this, it's just, it's just challenging to enter healthcare for a lot of patients. Um, access remains a barrier. And so one of the things that we try to do is, you know, create and advocate for low threshold uh, programs, you know, such as walk-in programs, street medicine initiatives that will offer wound care where the patients are physically. All right. Thanks. And um, Bruce, we had a question. What um, goes again to what people can do to get this information out? Um, what would you say the most important message would be for parents or for um, for for parents to share with their children on um, these drugs? One of the big issues is buyer beware. You don't know what you're getting. And I really believe that many of the products that are sold for health-related purposes, other than in pharmacies and other stores where there is a professional to provide accurate information could potentially be dangerous. We see similar activities and si similar contamination with products sold for weight loss over the counter in small stores, gas stations, bodegas, little you know shops. We, we've seen contamination for sexual enhancers, weight loss products, uh, stimulants to stay awake. Even people who sell stuff that claims it's good for diabetes and will control your glucose. We've had, there was recently products for arthritis and the arthritis products that were being sold really did work, except they had steroids in them and not medications that were called natural and herbal. So I'm always very cautious about the latest, greatest fix out there, so to speak. Absolutely. I know we're coming to the end of our time. Um, I'm going to go to our speakers with um, one last comment. Um, before I do, I just wanted to make mention there's information on the screen on how to um, register for continuing education credit for um, attending today's webinar. I know that's been uh, pretty active in the chat looking for that information that is on the screen um, and also information on our upcoming webinar when addiction and mental health collide. But um, Bruce, I'll, I'll go to you first. Uh, last word, um, last message to kind of leave with our um, attendees today. Last word is please put our 800 phone number into your phone and that's 
1-800-222-1222. If you're in New Jersey, you get us. If you're in Philly, you get Philly. If you're anywhere in the country, you get the local poison center. And please, if you're not sure you're having a side effect or if your patient is having consequences or something, call us. Let us know. Let's discuss it. And through not only helping you manage that case, we're also collecting data on epidemiology, potential clusters, outbreaks, et cetera. All right. Thank you. And thanks again for your presentation today. Thank you very much um, for having me. Dr. Salzman, last word um, for our attendees today. Um, I think it would be that I uh, xylazine is a problem. Uh, its presence is very real. The wounds are very real. And I believe withdrawal is very real. And we are still really trying to learn what best practices are to help take care of these patients who are struggling. Uh, but creating low barrier access into care is incredibly important. All right. Well, thank you again um, for your presentation. It was uh, so comprehensive in, in showing us the extent of, uh, of this threat. Um, thank you both, uh, both of our presenters. We, again, appreciate your time um, and sharing your expertise with us today. And thank you again to all of our attendees. So glad that um, you could join us to get this important information. Together, we can make an impact and um, I hope that you can join us on March 28th as we um, look at the impact of mental health on the addiction and opioid crisis that we are facing. So thank you again. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Bruce.